Dogs make the best companions for humans. This podcast aims to help make humans better companions for their dogs. Welcome to the Baru Podcast, a modern lifestyle podcast for dogs and their people. I'm your host, Charlotte Bain. I've been caring for other people's dogs for more than 15 years. And while I've learned a lot in my career, I definitely don't know it all. So I've collected an ever-evolving roster of amazing dog people, and I learn new things from them all the time. Hi, you guys. Thanks so much for joining me today for this episode of the Baru Podcast. Today, I chat with Dr. Lizzie Pearson of the Dog Aging Project. We dig deep about what the Dog Aging Project is, what it hopes to achieve, and how you can get your dog involved in the study that helps scientists understand how to help dogs and people increase health span and create longer, healthier lives for our canine companions and for humans. So let's jump into the chat. Are you in Texas? Is that where you are? Yeah, I'm in College Station, Texas, over at Texas A&M. Okay. Um, Well, first, thanks so much for popping on and talking to me about the Dog Aging Project. I would love it um, if you would just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do for the Dog Aging Project before we jump into the project and its vision and what it's all about and what it can tell us about dog aging and human aging. Yeah, so I'm Lizzie Pearson. I'm a veterinary fellow with the Dog Aging Project working at Texas A&M. Uh, so I've been a veterinarian for about five years and done some extra training after graduating from vet school. So moved from Texas to New Mexico to South Carolina, back down to Texas, um, just kind of doing some extra training and okay. have landed here with the Dog Aging Project where it's been fantastic. I've loved it. Uh, I help with some of the... Um, interactions with the clients, with all of our participants, uh, answering questions, you know, happily helping everything run. And how long has the Dog Aging Project been around? Quite some time now. Dog Aging Project officially started in 2014. Okay. Okay. What, um, so what is, let's just talk about the Dog Aging Project because I don't know a ton about it. Um, Yeah. So the Dog Aging Project is a community science project. Um, And what we do is we rely on the participation of dog owners all over the U.S. to help us collect data for scientific research. Um, And what we're doing is we're trying to identify the biologic and environmental factors that will help us maximize or, you know, get the longest amount possible out of our companion's dog's health and longevity. And when I say we're getting them to participate in collecting data, most of the time, this is just filling out surveys for us. So telling us their dog's stories, the dogs are Mm -hmm. still living at home with their owners that, you know, the vast majority of them never need to go do anything extra. It's just telling us about their dogs and their lives. Okay. And then what do you do with that, that information? So we have a giant database. Uh, Currently, I think the last I knew is of this month, we have about 42,000 PAC members. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so it's a lot. (laughs) Uh, And we take all of that data and we start looking at what we can see as far as trends, as far as, you know, what, what goes together, what goes where, you know. Uh, if this dog does this and that dog does that, is there any association? And so the bigger numbers we have, the stronger we can see as far as correlations. Um, okay. And so we're just starting to get to the point where we have enough data to come back because we're doing this over time. If we right. just look at one point in time, we can say, okay, well, that's what's going on at that one point in time. But if we have people filling us out these questionnaires year after year after mm-hmm. year, then we can say, okay, these dogs... One year we're doing this and the next year we're doing that. And Mm -hmm. if they were eating this food or doing this activity, what changed for these dogs versus the dogs that weren't eating that food or weren't doing that activity? And so we can start to try and parse out what factors have what effects on their lives. Okay. And what are some of the, have you noticed anything? Like, uh, has anything jumped out so far as far as like you look at nutrition, obviously and activity and, and all those things, but. Yeah. One of, one of the favorite things that we've found so far was uh, an association. And so we always have to be careful with association and causation. So an association between better cognitive health, so like brain health, 
okay. and companion dogs and physical activity. And that okay. could mean that Begner cognitive health uh, was, so you know, it was easier for them to take them out and go do more activity. So, you know, the dogs that were more awake, more aware in, in better spirits, they're like, okay, let's go do things, you know, right. because they weren't having that decline. But it could mean that dogs that, you know, were more active and were doing more activities didn't experience the same decline. So it was Okay. protective. And so as we study that over more years uh, and over more time, we'll hopefully be able to pull apart which one is it. Right. Is it more, does it look more at like cognitive, cognitive decline or more of overall like physical decline and decline all around, aging all around? All of it. Okay. We're, we're looking at so much. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Yeah. You, know, you name it. I feel like we're looking at it. Environmental factors, weight, okay. uh, you know, activities. We'll even ask, you know, what kind of Paths do you walk on? Do they walk on concrete? Do they walk on dirt? How many levels are your, on your house? How many stairs do they go up? The survey at the enrollment is about two to three hours long. Uh, that's how much information we act. Right. Ask for. And did, do the dogs have to be like a certain age to get started or do you just get all... No, we, all ages. We, we get all ages. We would ask for all ages. We would love to have anyone enroll any dog. Um, we're definitely looking for puppies uh, so that we can mm-hmm. follow them throughout their whole life. But anyone that has an older dog is also welcome to enroll their dog. They don't have to be healthy. They can have chronic health conditions. Boys, girls, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter mm-hmm. the gender, intact or not intact. Uh, both as well. We're, we're definitely looking for younger dogs that are not uh, spayed or neutered yet. And okay. in more rural areas, those are areas that we don't have as many dogs. So, you know, okay. anytime that we can increase so that we have, you know, a representative population of everything. If yeah. we have just dogs in cities, then it's like, okay, well, we can tell you about dogs in cities, but we want to tell you about dogs everywhere. So we'd right. love to find more puppies, more intact dogs, you know, dogs in rural areas. Right. And is the study just in the U.S. or is are you pulling from like uh, you know other countries as well? Currently, it's just in the U.S. Okay, okay, because that would be interesting to study how dogs, um, you know, in the natural, like you know, street dogs or um, in in other countries, mm-hmm. absolutely how they how they how they age compared to speaking to you know other dogs still. So. Um, well, that's co- super cool. Um, you're specifically looking for dogs that are spayed or not spayed and neutered because you don't have a lot of, um, you don't have a lot of representation in that correct area, or is there something specific that those dogs might bring to both? So yeah. the majority of pets tend to be spayed and neutered. Uh, yeah. so most of our enrolled dogs are spayed and neutered right now. Uh, okay. it, we, we'd like to have more intact dogs just so we can have a representative population and we can find out more about right. the dogs that are intact and they don't have to stay intact during the whole study. If it's a dog that's enrolled as a puppy and they haven't spayed and neutered yet. And then we see, okay, they were spayed or neutered when they were two or three months old. And then that's what happened over their lifespan versus right. they were, you know, a similar dog of a similar size was spayed or neutered when they were one year old. And then that's what happened right. over it or spayed it when they were two years old. That's one one of, mm-hmm. you know, the current really big topics is when do we spay and neuter our pets? And the answer is, right. we don't have great data to tell us for sure. You know, so, mm-hmm. you know, enrolling dogs and watching them through their life is how we figure out the best answer to that. Right. Right. Yeah. That's a kind of a hot topic right now. It spaying is. and neutering your pets because it's obviously for overpopulation, it's really important to do that. But I know that those hormones and all the good stuff that they get, you know, in puppy years, are supposed to help them, you know, become more balanced and um, healthier. What what was the inspiration behind the dog aging project? Was it based on what was human um, aging studies or? So actually, um, two of the founders, Dr. Promislau and Dr. Creevy, were um, at the University of Georgia together investigating the causes of death in companion dogs. Um, okay. And at the same time, the third founder, oh. Dr. Kaberlin, was looking at the basic biology of aging um, over at the University of Washington. And they all just okay. kind of ended up getting together talking about aging in general and how aging related to the causes of death. Um, and Dr. Pramislau ended up moving over to Seattle, um, and they ended up forming the Canine Longevity Consortium. Uh, and then from there, they went into the Dog Aging Project. 
Uh, and so just over time, everything was able to form into this amazing project. And they actually mm-hmm. received their grant from the NIA, the National Institute on Aging in 2018. Oh, wow. That's great. And so it's based out of uh, the University of Washington. I only ask because I grew up like literally a mile and a half from the University of Washington. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so-, so University of Washington and Texas A&M. They're the kind of two, you know, big bases. Got it. Got it. So why I was reading that dogs are a good model for studying human aging. Why, why is that? Do we know? So uh, dogs are kind of a, a nice model because like in humans, as they get older, the risk for many of their diseases increases. Um, okay. And so for the most part, uh, they get similar age-related diseases as humans. They're usually sharing our same environment. Um, sometimes mm-hmm. they're sharing our food. And so yeah. <laughs> we, we think that the findings from the study are going to be transferable to human health. Um, right. Interestingly, there are some age-related diseases that dogs don't get. Um, so like oh. heart attacks, you know, the, the classic human heart attack, it's extremely rare in dogs. So maybe studying that. dogs is going to help us learn how to avoid that in people. Um, and so just uh, share, since they share so many of the same things, and again, the environment, um, we, we hope that we can transfer that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess they share our whole lifestyles with us for the most part. A lot of the right? times so, you think about it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> if your dog's going for a walk, you're probably going for a walk. If you're not going yep. for a walk, your dog's probably not going for a walk. You know, a, a lot of it. If is, you're eating, yeah. If you're eating a French fry, your dog may or may not uh-huh. be getting a French fry. <laughs> right. <as well. laughs> or you in the case may of, think that they're not eating a French fry, but they really are. But they really are eating a French fry. My my guys definitely eat, eat some of my French fries. Yeah, that's for sure. It's like his favorite thing. Um. Well, that's great. And I know there's several different things that you're studying. So there's, um, you study the microbiome, mm-hmm. right? And you're studying, uh, you're studying the cognitive health. And what are some of the other things? I want to dig a little bit deeper into the microbiome and if you've made any discoveries, because I know that's like a hot topic right now of the connection between the microbiome and every part of our bodies and our canine bodies as well. So um, do you want to jump into that a little bit? Yeah. Uh, so as far as the microbiome, I'm not really involved in that project very much. Okay. So I, I can speak very vaguely about it, but most of it's okay. beyond my knowledge. Uh, so okay. <laughs> I, let, let's be real here. Uh, okay. that, that one's a little over my head. Uh, okay. So I know that we're doing some really cool and fascinating things and okay. I often collect samples to help, with okay. that, but <laughs> beyond, beyond sample collection, uh, I know that, uh, you know, we're, we're doing awesome things, but I, I don't okay. know details about it. Uh, well, we'll I know that we don't that. have many results back yet. Um, you know, okay. we're still in the sample collection process. Uh, you know, we're collecting data uh, and it'll be over time that it comes back. Um, one of the things that I do love that we do is part of the <laughs> National Institute of Aging uh, is that we are part of the Open Science Collaborative. And okay. so people are always allowed to apply for our data. Uh, and that data is then, you know, we go over their application and we will actually give it to them so that they can go through it and see what they come up with. So we work with a whole bunch of institutions um, across the, not just across the U.S., but across the world. Um, I think we last, I knew, had over 20 institutions that we worked with. Um, We have a bunch of researchers. And then we have private individuals that apply for our data, uh, ask for the data. We give them access, and then they analyze it and discover things uh, on their own. That's great. And then you all kind of, you do, do you, you all share that information, I'm assuming, or um, at least within the thing? dog aging project. Yes. We we're yeah. huge okay. on making sure that we share everything that we know, everything that we come up with. We have a, you know, we even keep our blog going to show, Oh, Hey, okay. we just published this. You know, this is what we're trying to share with you guys. Uh, this is, you know, kind of the, the lowdown. So this publication is trying to tell everyone this, you know, or yeah. hey, this just came out and we really want you to take away this from it. Right, right. So there was another um there was another thing I was reading about is the connection between the rapamycin because I know that's also mm-hmm. a hot topic in anti-aging. Um how are you utilizing that in the dog aging project? Yeah. So within the uh dog aging project, we have a several cohorts, so several groups, mm-hmm. and one of the cohorts is the triad cohort. Uh 
So the okay. test of rapamycin in aging dogs. And okay. what we're doing is we're determining whether rapamycin increases the lifespan of companion dogs. The reason why we're doing that is in clinical trials and um, lab animals, it's been shown to possibly increase lifespan. Uh, and so mice usually. And so yeah. they've shown an increase in lifespan and a delay or actually reversed in some of the age-related disorders. Um, we've done two smaller studies, um, and so now we're taking it to a larger study. Um, all the participants that are involved go through a lengthy process, making sure, hey, you know, this is what we're doing. Uh, do, would you like to be involved? Uh, and so mm-hmm. they're fully aware. There's no sneaky. Uh, yeah. And so what, they come and go to their regional vet schools that are participating. Um, and so okay. they go every six months. Um, and so once they go through screening, uh, they go every six months. and. They- they give rapamycin or placebo. It is a double funded okay. um, placebo controlled study and they give it once a week for a year. And then we will okay. follow them out for an additional two years to see how they do after. Um, during that time, uh, we have them reporting to us, hey, how are they doing? Anything coming up? You know, they fill out monthly at home observations and we track them. But it, the reason we're doing it is to see, you know, whether rapamycin increases lifespan of dogs and um, whether rice. Uh, rapamycin improves various measures of health in aging dogs. So um, we should probably touch on what rapamycin is. I've heard, uh, I actually heard of it from our veterinarian who was, who's actually really into anti-aging for humans. And she, she, she follows all the latest science mm-hmm. in regards to that. Um, I think she may have been the person who told me about the dog aging project, but I'm not quite clear on what, I know it's a, it's a drug, right? Mm-hmm. But I'm not quite clear on what it is and what it hopes to achieve. Yeah. And so it it is kind of like the newest thing. Well, it's not the newest thing, but it is a hot topic right now. And it's been really uh, big in human medicine for the last 10 years is possibly the newest anti-aging medication, something that's been studied pretty heavily. Um, It is a medication that's given. um, And so it was actually originally used as an immunosuppressive. Um, So uh, oftentimes given to people that had transplants um, and they found that there was some associations. um, And so we're not giving the same doses that people got at, uh, you know, as an immunosuppressive or during transplants, we're giving low dose, um, got it, lower doses of this medication. And, and, and what is, so it helps to slow down the aging process or reverse the aging process or what does it hope to do? Well, we think that it might do both. Um, and okay. when we look at those mice models, um, okay. some of them, it slows down the, the aging process. And then in other parts, it actually reverses. So like in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, a heart disease, and the, uh-huh. the heart actually showed not just a slowing down of the aging disease, the heart actually became uh-huh. healthier again. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Okay. And it was something that someone would have to take forever, or is it just something that, um, unclear so far, Um, (laughs) something that we'll actually be looking at because we give the medication for a year during this study. And then we look at them for the two years afterwards. And so it's how do they do during that year? And does it continue to have a protective effect for the two years afterwards? Or is, does it only help for the year that they're on it? And then the effects diminish. So that we don't know the answer to that. Not yet. And so the triad okay. study is still fairly new. Um, we're enrolling actively. Um, we, okay. have, we haven't had any complete the first year yet. So it, it'll be a while yet before we can say too much about it. Right. Okay. Got it. Have you guys discovered anything unusual yet so far or anything that was shocking to you? Or I don't know that we found anything shocking so far. I think the thing that's honestly shocking to me is just how much information we have. And, yeah. and how much, I mean, we have way more information than we have people to go through it. One of the things that makes the open science amazing. Mm -hmm. And there's so much, when I started looking at something for a paper, I was like, okay, I'm going to start doing a paper on this. And then I had to be like, okay, focus more. No, that's Mm -hmm. still too much data. Focus more. No, Mm -hmm. that's still about five papers worth of data. Focus more. And me, my mentor was like, no, you need to you need to focus more. That's still yeah. too much. It's <laughs> the most overwhelming and amazing yeah. amount of variables. And it's like, you know, you could spend the next 10 years looking at this one subject and still right. probably not run out of data. So mm-hmm. just the amount of information that we're getting back is so cool. 
And so you, you really just, yeah, you have to really hone in, hone in and hone in. Yeah, and like exactly. It. If, yeah. if you try and talk about too much all at once, then you lose the story. Uh, you know, if yeah. you're talking about, well, and dogs that went for a walk and also smelled the grass and also walked around a tree and yeah. also went to the stop sign and, you know, oh, wow. crossed the yeah. light, then you start losing the, it versus if you say, uh, dogs that went for a walk, you know, this happened, you know, so you right. have to focus on, you know, one variable or two variables and it's so that you can tell a good cohesive story. You know, the more things right. that you try and talk about, the more diluted your effect is, you know, well, and your science is going to be weaker. Yeah, potentially. <laughs> either, either that or you're going to have so many variables. A statistician that looks at it is going to go, you're insane. Yeah. <laughs> so, I know we talked about the triad cohort. Um, we, we also have several other cohorts. So again, the cohorts are kind of our groups of dogs. Um, once they kind of go through our enrollment process, they nominate their dog and they go through the enrollment process. Um, when they go through the enrollment process, they get to watch a video welcoming them from our, our chief veterinary officer. And then they'll go through that long survey, the health and life environmental survey, uh, two to three hours uh, and telling us all about their dog's life, all about their dog's story, asking more questions than you would ever think that could be asked about your dog. Interesting. You know, you, we ask a lot of questions when you go to the vet. No, th this is like that times 10. Um, and so when they finish that, they have the opportunity to upload um, electronic medical records. So, uh, you know, just scan, it, it's going to be the uploaded records that you've gotten from your veterinarian. Okay. It's not mandatory. It's, you know, it's helpful for us to have them, but it's not mandatory. Right. Uh, once you finish the health and life um, survey, you, they're a PAC member and they're a PAC member for the rest of their life. Wow. Um, and then from then, uh, for the dogs that did upload the medical records, those are going to be our population, our dogs that we'll start inviting to do other things. And so triad is one of them, but we also have the foundation cohort. So the group of dogs, um, that we're going to look at their DNA. And so that's about 8,500 dogs is the goal. And we're almost there. Wow. Um, all ages, all sizes all genetic backgrounds. Uh, and what we do with those is we send them a kit and the owners use that little swab uh, in there. And when they take a cheek swab sample uh, and then send it back to us. Okay. And so we use that to look at their DNA and we study the health measures and the age related like psychological and behavior traits. So we start taking that DNA that they gave us and then all the information in the survey and then all the information in the vet records and we start trying to find associations between diseases and frailty and right. genome-wide associations. So uh, really cool. Um, the next one is the precision cohort. And that one, when we fully enroll, is going to be about a 1,000 dogs. Again, getting pretty close. Yeah. Um, and those go to their vet um, if they decide to participate. And the vet, we send them a sample kit. Uh, and they collect saliva, blood, urine, some poop and some hair. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they do that annually. Okay. Um, and that, that's kind of where the microbiome goes in when I was talking about collecting samples. Yep. Um, yeah. And poop, so the poop we, samples. So, yeah, yep, exactly. <laughs> uh, master poop sample yeah. collector. Um, and then, uh, we, we do those samples and then they get them shipped back over to us. Um, and so we can track those changes over time. And so our goals with those are to identify the metabolomic predictors of disease and longevity. So how the microbiome changes with age, how the changes in the microbiome diversity impact aging, okay. um, kind of developing an epigenetic clock to predict biological age. So uh, are there any blood work variables that, you know, hey, we found that when this blood work marker is elevated your dog was more likely to live longer or to become, mm -hmm. you know, more, more likely to develop something or, you know, you, you can have a 15 year old dog. That's really healthy. 15 year old dog right. or a 15 year old dog. That's a really frail or, you know, weak 15 year old dog. So is one of those markers, something that we see more commonly in a, a frail version of a 15 year old dog. So, you know, uh, something that we're looking at in that one. Then we have a smaller cohort again. So our kind of small group is the centenarian cohort. And the, the name might give it away, yeah. but it's the oldest 0.1% yeah. of dogs in their size class 
and it's about 300 dogs. And so we'll be doing targeted genomic sequencing from them. So again, DNA samples, yeah. and then we're looking at specific specific areas of their DNA to help us identify some gene variations that confer especially long, healthy lives. You know, uh, what part of your DNA helped you live to be this long and this healthy? That's so cool. Um, and then, so, so those are, those are all the, and so do you, when, when somebody wants to like sign up their dog, Mm -hmm. what do they need to do if they're interested in, in being a part of that? And you, you, you choose dogs out of your already, your pack members that you were saying, right? So someone can't, someone can't just sign up for to be a part of the microbiome study, you, you, you look at all the stuff that they've submitted so far and correct. They can't just say, Hey, I heard about the triad study and I want to be a part of it. They can, you know, you can go, I want to be a part of it and you can enroll in the dog aging project and become part of the pool that we select from, but you can't apply specifically to it. Uh, So just as far as becoming part of the dog aging project, we have a website and and (laughs) you go to the website and it'll have an area where you can nominate your dog Mm -hmm. and we'll have a big questionnaire about, you know, how you, you, your life. And so how many pets do you have? Tell us about each of your dogs. Mm -hmm. And currently we allow one dog per household uh, that may change in the future, uh, but at the moment it's one dog per household. And so you, you have to choose who do you want to tell us about, uh, you know, <laughs> do you want to tell us about the baby? Do you want to tell us about the old one? You know, uh, right. you know, w- which dog do you want to share the story of? Um, yeah. and so you, you'll tell us, you know, what all dogs are in your house and then you'll choose one to nominate to be the pack member. And uh, mm-hmm. that, then you go through the survey, um, and then upload the records if you want to. And then that's where we'll choose from, you know? Right. It's great. What, what is the ultimate goal for the dog aging project and, and how does it, you know, how's, how's it going to help us moving forward? Yeah. And and so kind of like two ways to answer this. So it's like, you know, what's the goal, um, and how we're going to get there. And so, um, our work is centered on two goals, understanding how genes and lifestyle and environment influence aging and intervening to increase health span, which is the Mm -hmm. period of life spent free from disease. So it's, you know, not just lifespan, but the health span, the the good part of your life. Um, And how we're going to get there is how we're going to follow tens of thousands of dogs through their entire lives or, you know, the entire life that they're enrolled um, in order to identify biological and environmental factors that maximize health and longevity. Okay. Wouldn't it be nice if um, we could get our dogs to live a lot longer than they do? I think that's the one, the one downside of, of dogs is that they don't live very long or as long as we would like them to live. Right. I tell mine daily that he's, he's not, he has to live forever. Uh, yeah, <laughs> he's no pressure. No, no pressure. He, he's like he's my heart dog. Um, he, yeah, uh, he's nine. He's lived with me. His, I, I, he's, I've had him since day one, literally. Uh, when he, the day he was born, and so. Oh my god. Uh, we're, uh, I have separation anxiety from him. Uh, sure. So we you know when we're apart, uh, all I can think about is him. And so I tell him daily that he has to live forever. <laughs> he's, he's a larger breed, and so I'm like, he's nine right now, and I'm like okay, you're going to be 15. I don't care what it's like. You're, you're going to make it happily. I'm like to 15. Yep. What kind of, what kind of dog is he? He's a golden doodle. Yeah. Like a big one. Yeah. He, he's the, one of the, the standard. The big, big boys. Yeah. Cute. Well, 15 doable for sure. For that guy. Fingers crossed. Right? <laughs> yeah. It, it just <laughs> roll the dice. Yep. <laughs> yeah. What we're yeah. trying to do is take the roll of the dice away and be able to tell you what goes into it. But right now, yeah. Please, roll the dice. Absolutely. Oh, I had a question. Uh-huh. I don't know if it's something that you can answer, but I was reading that um I was reading that they have found that dogs with ear and eye issues tend to have a higher rate of cognitive decline. Is that something that you know anything about or who have had chronic ear and eye issues or neurological issues like with their ears and their eyes growing? You know, I haven't heard that one. Okay. Um, and, and that's one of those things where it goes back for, to correlation and causation. And mm-hmm. so there definitely could be a correlation. So, yeah. you know, we found that dogs with chronic ear and eye issues had a higher chance of cognitive decline, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the higher chance of cognitive decline is because the eye and ear issues. It could be that, you know, uh, dogs that 
didn't have ear and eye issues also had some other factor going on that was completely unrelated that protected them or you know it's not always x goes directly to y sometimes right. there's something else completely you know um uh, one of my favorite things is uh you know a feeding frequency people people yeah. really like to you know how often are we supposed to feed our dogs and so it's like okay there was a uh, something that came out the other day and it was like okay it's better to feed your dog once a day and it's like well yeah. We we found an association between feeding once a day and better health, but that right. doesn't mean that feeding your dog once a day makes your dog healthier. It could be that dogs that are healthier um, choose to be fed once a day or, you know, uh, owners of dogs and better health feed them you know once a day and dogs that are sicker they feed them twice a day or you know it's like it's it, you could always flip-flop the variables you're like right just because they're associated doesn't mean that it's causative right there's not enough information there yet exactly is essentially what you're saying exactly and, and you know we're we're sending out uh, some feeding frequency surveys and it's, we're gonna you know over the next decade we're gonna learn a yeah, lot absolutely that's so cool. Um, I think we like to just emphasize that, uh, you know, the the community aspect uh, of the Dog Aging Project. Um, so, you know, there, there's a real sense of community in our pack members. They they have this uh, little private online forum called the, the Dog Park. So once they become pack members, they can create a little dog park account. Um, and they all log on there and just share pictures of their dogs or ask each other questions um, and they interact with each other and then have mm-hmm. insider access to the research team. So they can actually ask the research team, you know, and they, most of the time they get answers. Sometimes the answer is we don't know, but you know, right. Um, and then we host, you know, monthly little, you know, get togethers with some- like we just had one yesterday that was talking about nutrition, um, but just talking about, Hey, this is, this is what we have going on. Or, you know, what is, what topic do you want to know more about? We'll pull them and say, what do you want to know? And based on yeah. what they say they want to know, we'll hold a, you know, monthly, you know, Hey, this is, this is what you guys wanted to talk about. And so just the, the sense of community, um, yeah. and, you know, it's, it's just a really cool group. And even, even in the office, it, this is one of the most yeah. friendly together, you know, accepting places I've ever worked. That's so great. Well, you know, dogs bring us all together. I mean, it's like you right? know, sharing the love of your working with and around people who share the love of their dogs and usually have a special, you know, special place in their heart for their dogs, right? Absolutely. That's so great. That's like a way that you guys can give back to the so they're giving you something by, you know, following their dogs and uh and being able to um uh submit all all the information that you need and then you guys are able to give back through meeting there. Yeah, exactly. Questions to share them and as much yeah. as we can. Yeah, that's so great. Yeah. Maintain little blogs, you know, you know, oh, know. what else is going on? Um, some of it's just fun stuff. So right now we have, uh, we, we've named them the dogs of the office. And so here at the, the Texas a <laughs> office, we, we have several dogs that get to come in, to, you know, and so uh, we've started a little uh, TikTok account. And- oh, you do? What What is it? Uh, I, <laughs> I'll get back to you on that shortly. Okay, put you on the spot. Yeah, I'm like, I, I don't have a TikTok. I'm a social media dinosaur. I don't. Um, I don't either. Yeah, yeah. but I, I'll get it for you shortly. Um, okay. and, and so it, it's the the dogs of the office. And so we've started making little TikToks with all the office dogs, and it's like you know what they're like introductions, and you know, yeah, then doing like little trends like the. Uh, all the cup challenges we start we started putting all the dogs through all the little cup challenges like going oh like college. find the treat and those things yeah, yeah. so you know. you know just just fun <laughs> things too and these are just the dogs that belong to you guys yeah this is just our personal pets yeah because you don't meet the dogs in the studies like um the only ones that we person. meet are the the dogs in the rapamycin phase so the triad dogs that go, oh, yeah, um, so the ones that come into texas a&m uh i get to meet those because i help with those appointments Um, uh, and I definitely enjoy interacting with all the owners and the pets. It's, 
Yeah, that's great fun. And then um, I sometimes some of the other sites send pictures when they do their evaluations. And so I just got a picture of uh, another one that went last yesterday, I think yesterday for their recheck, uh, their first recheck. And it was the cutest lab sitting there with their feet up in the air doing a little pose. And I was like, <laughs> that is so precious. Uh, yeah. So, but by and large, no, uh, we don't get to meet them because they're all living at home with their owners doing their doing their Yeah. Things. They don't even know they're part of a project. No, yeah. pretty much none of them know they're part of a project. Even the ones that come in like every six months. Yeah. yeah. They're they're so guys. Anyways. That's so cute. Well, thank you, Dr. Pearson. Um, yeah, I can't wait to check back in a few years and see what we've learned so far. Yeah, really right? looking forward to it. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Baru Podcast. If you want to get your pup involved in the Dog Aging Project, you can go to dogagingproject.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to follow us and rate us wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're enjoying the podcast, you can now help keep these episodes coming by buying me a coffee. The link is in the show notes. Do you have a canine behavior question or a canine health question or a story of canine companionship that you want to share on the Baru podcast? You can email me, charlotte at baru.com. And I would love to hear from you. All right, you guys. Let's chat next week.